Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, but it's a really complicated URL, so just go to YouTube and search for Virtual Memories Show. Now you can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. In fact, a new one went up just last week, and it has got a dynamite lineup. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. It's another crazy week ahead for me with Monday and Friday visits to Capitol Hill involving those day-long trips up and down on uh, Amtrak. Technically, these visits don't count as lobbying because I'm actually being invited to provide information on a topic. I say technically because as part of my job, I actually have to file these quarterly lobbying reports with the U.S. Senate website, which is a prospect that fills me with Kafkaesque dread. But, you know, what are you going to do? Um One committee actually told me that they'd like to have my association testify in a hearing this September. Um, I don't think any of them realize my association only has one employee, me. Um, I'm vainly hoping that some of my member companies would step up and, and take the slot. But at the same time, this is what they're paying me for. Um, The thing is, (laughs) I've never even had to testify in court, much less in front of a congressional committee. So again, Kafkaesque dread. Um, this stuff is probably all contributing to the general sense of anxiety I've, I've had for the last couple of weeks. Um, I consider it crippling, but to an outside observer, I am functioning just fine. So I either do a great job of hiding this or I'm just overreacting to a little mood imbalance. Um, but it's nothing that a few yo-yo trips up and down the Acela corridor won't fix, you know? Now, uh, this week's show comes from pretty far away from Acelaville. Um, My guest is Matt Ruff, and we recorded at his home in Seattle during my little vacation out there around July 4th. Matt and I were supposed to record the previous summer when I had a trade show to attend in Seattle, but the problem is that big negotiation I was in with FDA, and all of this stuff ties back into that, for those of you who are longtime listeners, for those of you who are just listening because it's Matt, I'm sorry to just bore you with all this stuff. Anyway, that big negotiation made uh, that previous summer's trip to Seattle untenable. Um, But as it turns out, the timing was even better this summer. Uh, See, last year, Matt put out this fantastic novel called Lovecraft Country. Uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's it's centered on a black family living in Chicago in the mid-50s. And um, they're involved in producing this, well, in the book, what's called the Safe Negro Traveling Guide. Uh, basically a guidebook for black Americans to figure out what hotels, what restaurants, etc. they can stop in when they're they're driving around the country or just going on a vacation. Um, But the thing is, on top of the racism that this family has to contend with, they also discover that they're tied into this centuries long supernatural plot. Um, And the book breaks out a different family member and a different horror plot uh, in each chapter. And it, it builds to this amazing crescendo. It is a thrill ride of a book, Lovecraft Country, and I enjoyed the living heck out of it. Now, What makes it fortuitous that I missed last year's opportunity to talk with Matt is that since that time, Lovecraft Country got bought to uh, and greenlit as a series by HBO. Uh, It's going to be produced by Jordan Peele from Key and Peele and and Get Out fame, as well as Misha Green and J.J. Abrams. So 
That means we actually have the incredibly rare species of guest this time, a writer who has received good financial news about his work. Um, I'm trying to think of one in recent years for whom I could say that, and I think Matt's the, the only one. Anyway, uh, I was really glad to sit down with him. Despite the the Hollywood news, Matt is a very down-to-earth guy, a uh, really fun conversation to, to have. Uh, it's somebody who I've read a few books of, uh, in addition to Lovecraft Country, and... Um, he is very hard to pin down as a writer, but um, that's that's part of what he enjoys doing. So here's Matt's incredibly sparse bio from his website. There'll be more about his life that comes up in the course of conversation. Anyway, he writes, I am the author of the novels Fool on the Hill, Sewer, Gas, and Electric, the Public Works Trilogy, Set This House in Order, A Romance of Souls, Bad Monkeys, The Mirage, and Lovecraft Country. Oh, I also want to add... Uh, many thanks to Tom Tomorrow, who suggested initially that I record with Matt. Uh, took a year longer than I expected, but I'm so glad that Tom Tomorrow slash Dan Perkins uh, made the suggestion. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Matt Ruff. So I read Lovecraft Country in mm -hmm. preparation, and because it's an amazing novel... And I had this this awful moment, finishing it, enjoying the hell out of it. And I actually had to check with a black science fiction, a fantasy writing pal of mine <laughs> and say, is it okay that I, I dug this novel? Because it's a white author writing about, you know, a very intrinsically black experience. And I don't want to feel like I'm the white guy who is touring, um, you know, this this thing. But, you know, do, do you feel as a black author who read this that it's good? He's like, oh, yeah, Matt did the research. You know, it's good. He did the work. You know, we we give him the seal of approval. It, it's OK. <laughs> How much was that uh, a consideration, though, for you working on this book? How sensitive were you to the the cultural appropriation vibe, all the aspects of being a, a white author writing a book about a uh, Things that were inherently black experience while also making it really fun and doing the fantasy, science fiction and horror. I, I guess, I mean, to start with, I mean, it, it 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 would be hard to avoid thinking about it if only because other people kept bringing it up whenever I would tell people what I was working on. And it was usually, though, other other white writers who would say something like, wow, you, you're braver than I am. You've, exactly. You've got a lot of balls <laughs> and they would they would say it in a way that, you know, is like it, it was, it was, they were praising me, but at the same time, the way you'd praise somebody who's like volunteering for a job, running into burning buildings to yeah. save orphans. It's like, I'm, Boy, I wouldn't do that, but yeah, you yeah, know, it's, yeah. it's, you'll, you'll probably die a, a miserable death buried into tons <laughs> of flaming rubble, but I'm glad somebody's trying that. So, um, my own feeling though, is that it's, it's a Matt Ruff novel, no matter what it's about. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do better work when I'm working on the novel I actually want to write. So it would be silly to try and talk myself out of something just because I felt like that some other people might not think I should have written it. Um, so I, I tend to think of that sort of thing as more of a, an advertising problem, something to think about after or a marketing problem. It's like write the novel the best I can and then I'll worry about what people are going to think later. And it, of course, I'm, I'm not perfect at that that sense of detachment, but... I have a strong enough sense for when the novel is working the way I want it to that I, I can not get hung up worrying too much on reaction. And then, I'll, I'll you know, if I'm going to have panic attacks, I'll do it after the, the writing and editing is done. There's plenty of time. There's plenty of lead time before publication where you can be like, oh, gosh, I actually did this. What am I going to say when the mm -hmm. questions start? And um, But, yeah, I've I've been sort of pleased by the reaction and that like black readers have generally I, it's nice the seal of approval yes that that generally the the reaction of black readers has been thank you you know and to the extent that i'm still getting ambivalent reactions again it seems mostly a, a white thing where either people an oversensitivity to either exactly either, was, either, was, yeah. either a misguided sense of I don't know. There's this feeling that among some white folks, I think particularly progressives, who just feel like, well, no, you, you should really leave this subject matter to to people who've lived it. Um, or it's just it just touches on some nerve in their in their own psyche where they might like to be writing about this stuff, but they're scared to. So that's that's where I get the weird reactions. But from black readers, I I, I haven't had that issue. So. And I, you know, I'd like to say, well, that's as I expected, but of course I, I'm, again, just, just because when I would talk about it, when I was working on it and people would be like, oh, wow, 
you got a lot of balls. And you hear that a dozen times and you're like, oh, God, what am I getting myself into? <laughs> but then, too, that, you know, if you are nervous, you're going to stay focused. You're going to concentrate. You're going to do a better job just because you want to you wanna know if this blows up that you, you did the best you could. So, and... Um, and then I just generally believe that that the the best drama is, is usually hiding in the part of the woods where you're nervous about going anyway. So I generally think it's a good sign when I'm a little nervous about what I'm working on. I think every one of my novels has had a at least a portion of it where I was like, gosh, you know, if 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 I do this badly, it's going to be terrible and embarrassing, and I'm going to have to hang my head in shame forever. But if I pull it off, it'll probably be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> have any of your books been received the way you thought they were going to be received? Um, meeting the expectations of what you you thought. of course you know you expect all of them to be gigantic mega bestsellers who i'm just kidding um but no i mean that 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 happens though where you you're you're convinced that you've come up with an idea that's incredibly sellable and will be you know will be really popular and i i yeah i'm very bad at judging the market i'm just very fortunate in having an agent and a publisher who been willing to stick by me and, and give me my head and let me do what I want to do rather than forcing me into a particular path. I mean, my career has been very odd in that all of my novels are in different genres and they don't follow logically one from the other. And um, like my, my biggest commercial success was Bad Monkeys, my fourth novel, which is sort of a Philip K. Dick psychological thriller. And which I also enjoyed the heck out of. But, which I didn't expect to do. Like, you know, that was what was so funny. It was like I'd finished, I'd finished Set This House in Order, which I thought was, was going to be a big breakthrough novel because I, I, I still think it's one of my best. And um, people who've read it love it, but it's, it's still, you know, it's not, it's not one of my best-selling novels for sure. And so then I moved on to Bad Monkeys, which I thought, well, it's this little gem of a story. I'll get it out of my system before I work on the next big novel. And, of course, it's that one that took off. Took yeah, off yeah. and... and uh, you so it was a, a palate cleanser, sort yeah, of kind of kind of thing. And then yeah. the natural thing to do then is yes, you have this critical success, like either write a sequel or write something in the same vein. And instead, I decided to do the Mirage, which is a it's not entirely you know off the wall, following on Bad Monkeys, but still, it's it's a nine eleven novel, so that's that's kind of an odd choice. And again didn't didn't really follow up on on the success of bad monkeys and i'm glad i did it and i'm i'm glad my publishers let me do it cuz i think it's a great book but again it was not it was not a logical choice if you wanted to just build on the success of of bad monkeys and so so it's kind of nice now with lovecraft country to come back around and have that doing really well and i was hoping i was hoping that for once i i would hit the zeitgeist and and catch people's attention but you never know and i've learned to stop trying to guess so um Certainly, I, I did not see the, the HBO series coming, so that was that was a nice... Although you, you've mentioned that it began as a, a TV pitch, mm -hmm. uh, Lovecraft Country. What was the, well, the process of going from uh, TV pitch to novel to series by, yeah. um, in terms of the story that you ended up conveying within the book itself? You know, how much of what was in the TV pitch became the, the book and how much of, I know it's in the process of being transformed now, um, but how much do you see Lovecraft Country, you know, changing into another shape, I suppose, um, for this new series? So, yeah, this, this basically, yeah, I had this, this epic, epically productive, unsuccessful uh, pitch meeting back in, I guess, 2007, 2006, somewhere around there with a couple of folks associated with Fox Studios, and they wanted me to pitch them ideas. And um, I pitched the Mirage, I pitched Lovecraft Country, and then one other one other idea called 88 Names. And they didn't it's not a spinoff 88 lines about 44 women. The great no, song no, no, no. It's a, right? it's a, it's a, a, that was a sort of cyberpunk. It was like, yeah, the, the Matt Ruff's version of snow crash, I guess, in a, in a sense, um, which I would read, well, well, which I, which I, time which, to get to. which I may still write, <laughs> but, um, but in any case, yeah, they didn't bite on any of these ideas. They were all wrong for TV at the time for one reason or another. So I decided, well, let's go to plan B. And first I did The Mirage because it seemed the most topical. It was a, you know, it's a 9-11 novel thriller. So imagine 24, but set in a world where the U.S. and the, the Middle East have traded places. So the, the protagonists are a group of Arab Muslim homeland security agents trying to solve a mystery while, you know, Americans are coming in and trying to blow up their country. Um, 
And I can't and, imagine why that didn't take off. But go on. Yeah, I um, and the reason you know, I picked it because it was topical, but also because it was it was a a story that was easier to to see as a novel. In that I had imagined like a a, a multi season series of it, but if you stripped away all of the the sort of side plots and just focus on this central mystery that these folks were trying to solve that, that created a, a story arc very much like what you'd find in a traditional novel. So that's what I did. The problem with Lovecraft country is it's, it's meant to be like the X files, but with protagonists who are, um, basically it's a black family that owns a travel agency in the 1950s and they publish uh, a, a travel guide called the safe Negro travel guide, which is based on real guides that existed at the time that list hotels and restaurants across the country that accept the black customers. And so my Fox Mulder character is a, a son of the family, Atticus Turner, whose job is to act as a sort of field researcher for the guide and drive around the country looking for places that'll, that'll take him in. And, um, Atticus is also a nerd, and so the he's a science fiction and fantasy fan, and so the, the basic idea is that he and the family, we get drawn into a series of weekly paranormal adventures. And the reason it's called Lovecraft Country is sort of a double entendre, that he, at the same time they're facing these sort of paranormal horrors, they're also dealing with the, the more mundane horrors of life in Jim Crow era America. So it's the Lovecraft, you've got both horror and you've got white supremacy because H.P. Lovecraft was, of course, famously racist. And um, so it would be sort of which is the bigger threat to your, their safety and sanity, the, the extra-dimensional monsters or the, the white Americans who are, are trying to oppress them. And like the X-Files, it was going to be two kinds of things. There were going to be the Monster of the Week episodes where my characters got to sort of live out... Um, genre trope stories that would historically have excluded black protagonists and see how things change when you put a black protagonist into this. And then there would also be the mythology stories that told this larger tale about Atticus's struggle with this group called the, the Order of the Ancient Dawn, which is this group of white sorcerers who are interested in Atticus for reasons of their own. So, and in, the problem with transitioning this into the novel is that that the the monster of the week concept, the individual stories, were were things that were very key to the concept. Because one of the things I really wanted to do was to to sort of go back and rewrite history and and replay these sort of classic SF and fantasy and horror tales with black protagonists. So that sort of suggested a, a short story collection format, which. If you've if you've ever talked to a publisher, they kind of like yeah. oh short oh, the stories. least saleable form great. <laughs> and I'm not really a short story guy anyway, so I I wanted to figure out a way to make it work as a novel, but I didn't want to sacrifice that, and so I wanted to figure out a way to get both the monster of the week and the mythology arc in one package, and. Um, basically, Netflix came to the rescue. They they invented binge watching and. I realized that, well, I intended to do this as a TV series, so what if I do the literary equivalent of a TV season that you binge watch? And the novel is structured very much like, you know, an, an eight-episode TV season where you've got the, the long opening chapters, like the, the two-hour pilot, and then most of the other chapters are about half that length, so those are the one-hour Monster of the Week episodes, but each one also progresses the, the larger arc story. And each chapter stars a different member of Atticus's extended family, so I also get a chance to, to really get to know all the characters. And, um, and then midway through the book, there is another extra long chapter, which is sort of like the Sweeps Week special yeah. with, with amazing revelations about what's really going on. Um, and that sort of worked. And, you know, happily, as usual, my publisher was totally on board with it. So I said, okay, let me do that. And so, and of course, in the back of my head is the thought that this will also be a great proof of concept that this could actually work because it, it, it's supposed to read kind of like a TV series. So if you like it and you'll, you'll immediately see how it could work in that format. So, and, uh, yeah, I, I got, there were a number of different parties interested in it, but we ended up optioning it to Warner Brothers. And um, Jordan Peele, I think, is the one who discovered it. He's he's going to executive produce, and, um, and he's a big black nerd. Yeah, and um, he is. Yeah, yeah, he is. I mean, he's described himself as a blurred in interviews. I've, I've, yeah. 
No, and he was well. Of course, I knew nothing about about Get Out hadn't happened yet when I first spoke to him. But I obviously, watched it. I put it on my iPad, and I was going to watch it on the flight out here, and I didn't get the chance. It's killing me that I didn't watch it before sitting down. No, no, no. You, but, but it's it's yeah. It's well, I I, I envy you then because it's a lot of fun, and it is very much you know yeah. It's it's sort of Lovecraft Country meets Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. So it's a great. It's sort of, yeah, it's like as soon as I saw that, I'm like, oh, now I see why he was so excited about this. We're, we're both trying to do kind of the same thing here. And J.J. Um, Abrams was also involved, which doesn't hurt either. And um, Misha Green, who is, um, she's done a, she's done this great show called Underground that, that I think was unfortunately recently canceled by WGN. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't got nearly the, the circulation it should have, but that her, it's basically the, the great escape set on a slave plantation. And it's, it's awesome. Yeah. And if you, you can catch the first two seasons, you definitely should. And I'm hoping that some other network will pick it up now that WGN has canceled it. But so they, they, these were all folks who I, I could see would really get the story and do a great job with it. So I was crossing my fingers that, wow, this will, this will be great if it works. And then of course, get out came out and blew up. And I think that's what opened the door to make HBO really excited to do whatever Jordan Peele wanted to do. And then um, they call it liberal horror series, I believe is how it was. Uh... <laughs> it's been kind of funny. I got to say that, that watching the trade press, I mean, how the trade press, of it the trade was, uh... press and, and then people on Twitter and Facebook who, who obviously haven't read the novel, trying to guess what it's about from the descriptions. And that's, that's been it's kind like, of no, interesting. No, the answer is right there. It, it's no, all. No, no, but it, it is funny though, that, that just some of the assumptions like beginning with, because it's described as taking place in Jim Crow America, I, I think there's a, a natural assumption that it must be set in the South. And in fact, Except for the opening road trip where Atticus is driving home to Chicago, it's it's all in the north and the northeast. And um, part of the reason for that was that you know I I was sort of fascinated doing the research that that of course the the north was as racist as the south, but it it was more cagey about it. Where the it was south more embraced, coded, yeah, as opposed to overt, yeah. Where the south embraced apartheid openly and and kind of had to because the whole point was to exploit the the black labor base and and keep slavery going and as much as it was possible to do that. Um, the north basically just wanted black folks gone, and that was why the the real life travel guides like the Green Book were, were actually much more useful in the north and west because there weren't necessarily signs warning you where you could and couldn't go and. Even when people were discriminating against you, they often wouldn't tell you why. They would just say, oh, sorry, we don't have a room to rent. We just forgot to put the no vacancy sign on. So particularly for doing horror, it just seemed to me this was sort of this extra level of paranoia with the same level of physical threat just actually yeah. suited the, the story of the subject matter more. And it also tells you something about history that not everybody realizes. That's that's another reaction I bet if people have read the book. It's like, I didn't realize things were that bad north of the Mason-Dixon line. It's like, yep. As opposed to now. Yeah. Never, uh, oh, never mind. I won't even get into now. Well, now that it's like now the whole country has become the north in a sense that, yeah, yeah. racism still happens, but everybody denies that they're doing it rather than at least at least in the deep south, you in, in the you old days, you, you knew what you were getting. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, even, yeah. Okay. So yeah, so they um, they they got Jordan and Misha and uh, JJ came on to produce and Warner Brothers optioned it and then yeah and then Get Out blew up and uh, HBO said okay we'll we'll pick this up and they're going to take it straight to series which is like wow yeah I got the golden ticket so um, had you had outside of that that O six or O seven meeting much Hollywood experience previously. Um, no, I mean, I, you know, periodically someone like bad monkeys has been optioned a couple of different times. Currently Margot Robbie is, is got it and is, is, uh, <laughs> wants to star as Jane Charlotte. Yeah. Um, and I, th I, I remember way back in the day when Fool in the Hill came out meeting with someone, I think from the Spielberg empire or orbit who they were mostly interested in having me you know do, do you want to come out to hollywood and try being a screenwriter and at the time i really was not interested in that because bart fink would have come out a year or two before that so you would have had some idea as as to the hell you had been descending it i'm just <laughs> <laughs> no but it's just um i i yeah i had that ever appealed to you as an idea though I don't, I, you know, I, I'm, first of all, I, I've never learned to drive. So that, LA would mind. not be You're a good, done. <laughs> okay. that, that and right. I don't, I don't like <laughs> deserts particularly. So yeah, I don't think LA would be for me. And I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm not the most introverted writer I've ever met, but, um, I, I'm definitely not 
that great at playing with others, at least when my own work is concerned. So I, I don't know. I just don't think I would fit into Hollywood or a writer's room. Um, so no, I've always just wanted to write novels and then and hopefully make enough money from that, either from the, the books themselves or from movie rights to just be able to keep doing it until I, you know, they bury me in the backyard. And I saw the hole back there. Yes. That they've already dug <laughs> <the ditch. laughs> Uh, do you see any sort of through line to your work? I mean, you mentioned a jumping from genre to genre, you know, form to form. Is there a, you mentioned a Matt Ruff novel. Is there a, a Matt Ruff I, novel? I mean, there are, there are certain themes I seem to keep going back to. And I, I think the, the the two main things I would point to are I I like stories that take people from, with different worldviews, folks who would never choose voluntarily to interact with one another and forces them into a, a small space, like traps them in a car together or, or makes them deal with one another and in a situation where there's no easy outs, where they're, they're never, you know, not only don't they agree, but they're probably going to continue to disagree. Then they're not allowed to just kill each other off. And, um, that's, that sort of thing really appeals to me. And then I, as something of an extension that I like doing sympathetic portraits of, characters from very different backgrounds from my own, either either people who've come from completely different worldviews or who, to the extent that we're the same, they face very different challenges than I do. And I think that you know, Lovecraft Country sort of taps into that, where I wanted to write about you know, the challenges that faced by these black characters in the 1950s. And I, I also didn't want them all to be cookie cutters of one another, which is another important part about giving them all space to grow and breathe. It's not like, you know, seven identical black characters. It's seven hopefully very different and, and differently motivated black characters. And and especially as they interact with one another. Yeah. I think that also comes out in their contrast. So. And I, you know, yeah, that that to me is, is one of the most fun things is to do sort of a psychologically realistic portrait and sympathetic portrait of, of folks who are different from me and, and in the context of telling a, hopefully a really engaging story. So that, those, those are my, I think my, my two biggest three lines. And then, um, I guess I do have that sort of not science fiction, but science fictional outlook where I just like to, to sort of explore systems and, and just ways of living. And that was the other, I think that was the other big draw off with Lovecraft country was, learning about these black travel guides. And that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg of this sort of vast infrastructure that, that African-Americans created to sort of navigate the day-to-day -day challenges of, of life in legal segregation. And I, I'm hesitant to call it secret history because it's only secret if you didn't live through it, if yeah. you weren't black. But But to me, it was like discovering this sort of lost world. And it was really kind of fascinating. And it also pointed the way towards how do I tell a story about the horrors of racism that people are actually going to want to read? Because that's not necessarily fun. But if you make the story about this, this sort of actually very clever ways that people came up to to deal with this intolerable situation, that 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 becomes an interesting story that has room for sort of heroism and and large and small victories, even though, you know, the background of race, racism is going to continue well beyond the scope of the story. It's like you can still have a, a hopeful ending, if not a happy one. So, um, and all the fun SF and fantasy tropes. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that goes without saying, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, one thing to portray that solely in a realist mode, which again would be far more depressing. I and I, I guess that's another, that's another through line you could point to is I do like hybrid works that combine genre elements with, with more realistic or literary tropes. Um, because again, I, I think you get, you get to play with the best of all worlds rather than being locked into one mode. So yeah, I would probably be very bored trying to do just a straight, straight up SF novel or a straight up, um, you know, lit novel. Um, so this is fun for me. It's it's always difficult for publicists who are trying to yeah. <laughs> pitch pitch me like, what do we call this? And you know, although X cross with Y is it's becoming it's becoming yeah. more acceptable. But I I remember my you know my very first novel. There was this this challenge. Like, yeah, do we market this as straight fantasy or do we market this as literary? And my my publisher at the time, Morgan Entrick, was smart enough to know that if you 
if you, you know, let fantasy people know it exists, they will find it. And it's the lit people you got to not scare away. So they did a very ambiguous cover that, you know, could be one or the other. And I think that that probably saved me from being pigeonholed, pigeonholed yeah. early on. And then, you know, and then I did Sewer, Gas, and Electric and then set this house. And at that point, they were like, fine. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's the thing. We'll let it go. Uh, yeah, Sewer, Gas, and Electric is the first thing I'd read of yours and... Which you mentioned uh, Dick and Lovecraft being, you know, um, they'll say influences or at least. Um... Oh, yeah. They're 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 people whose work. I, I it fascinates me. I, I don't always like the the use they themselves made of it. I mean, it was funny. Dick and Dick and Lovecraft are, are similar in that they're both authors who when I first encountered them, I, I think I liked their imitators better than them because they're <laughs> the, the raw material was sort yeah. of like. Well, Lovecraft just yeah, he 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 his language is hard to get used to. His um he just never uses one word when twelve will do and, and SAT word, SAT word. And then um Dick's problem, I think, was that he just he needed a better editor than he got. He needed somebody to rein him in and say, Yeah, okay, we need a little more continuity here and we need this needs to make a little more sense. Yeah. When your editor is methamphetamine, it tends yeah, not to yeah. work that well. So. So I, that's that's like with both of them. With Lovecraft, I've come around a little bit more on. I, I I can appreciate him more in his own terms now. Dick, I still a lot of the time feel like, yeah, this this I guy. I wish could've... this would have been refined. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Um, Pynchon aspect uh, to me, uh, Pynchon seems to be the image hanging over sewer gas and electric. But you know, I don't know if that's just me projecting my own. When I was 22 and heavily influenced by Gravity's Rainbow and crying a lot, 49, I, Gil. To my great shame, I've still not read Gravity's Rainbow except for the opening paragraph, which is beautiful. Which is enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stick with crying a lot, 49. That's, that gets you, you know, Pynchon compressed. He, he's, I think Pynchon, Pynchon is one of those people who fascinates me as much for who he is as as what he's done. It's just this, because he's, of course, this great mystery of what does he look like, this, this sort of famous. I, I have one guest who has met him. Yeah. I hope. He may be lying to me when he showed me a copy of uh, Mason and Dixon with a signature, but um, he's friends with Matt Groening, and he and Matt grew up as Pynchon freaks, and Groening called him one day and said, hey, we're recording with Pynchon over at the Upper West Side at a recording studio. Do you want to come by? And the guy's like, yeah, Matt, because you and I kind of were completely fucking nuts for Pynchon. <laughs> so yes, I would like to go there. Uh, he said the great thing was that as freaked out as Matt and this guy were over meeting Pynchon, uh, Pynchon's son was that freaked out over getting to meet the Simpsons guy. That was his, wow. his he's like, I don't care about dad, whatever. He's, he's just some, some novelist, but you know, you did the Simpsons. That's yeah. So everybody's got their, their freak out. Thing. Well, in my, in my case, he's, he's married to my agent. So, oh, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but we've never actually met that I, that I know of. It's like back in the day, I, I, I think at one point we were talking about me babysitting, but that, that window passed <laughs> without ever being gone through. So I don't know, maybe one day I will still get a chance to meet him, but I do have another guest whose son is on Pynchon's son's like high school athletic team or whatever, or was a few years ago, but he refused to go because he idolized Pynchon so much that he couldn't bear to actually meet him in person <sighs> uh, on the off chance that they, they would. I had the same thing with Irvin Welsh, uh, the train spotting guy. When I asked him about, you know, people he would freak out around, he told me he blew off, not blew off. He freaked out and couldn't interview David Bowie twice Wow! because he said, I, I couldn't go meet someone whose posters I had on my room when I was a kid. Like I just, I couldn't get over that and then actually sit in the room with him i'm like okay that's... i understand but i would i would think that that that's one of those cases where you'd regret it more not trying yeah that's my thing that's you know i figure first i figure everybody's joe ultimately yeah you know the, you just got to find the the common human aspect um i don't know i, yeah. I bet there i've met a few who are not but <laughs> but yeah i i, I agree that you, you more often than not, you'll just find they're, they're ordinary folks. But yeah. Or at least you'll find something that you can, something you can, that you can connect, connect with, to. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but Pynchon is still a, uh, was he um, a literary influence as far as you go? And you also have a Cornell connection uh, where he, I, I think with, I think with Pynchon, it was world. more, it was more the legend of Pynchon, like mm -hmm. the, the, oh, yeah, you're I saying, mean, yeah. the, the phenomenon of, as opposed to the work. Well, yeah. Like the, the, Obviously, one of the tropes that ends up in sewer gas and electric is the the alligators in the sewers thing. Although in in, <laughs> in this case, it becomes a shark in the sewers, and that's sort of pension by way of. And now, oh, wow, I I think the guy's name was Robert Daly. He wrote a book called The World Beneath the City, which was the the original source of the urban legend uh, uh, urban legend of alligators in the sewers because it's 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 all about. It was written in the nineteen fifties, and it was all about. Um, 
basically Manhattan infrastructure. And there was one chapter about uh, this guy called Smelly Kelly. He worked for the <laughs> the Department of of Public Utilities, and he his basically he was his job was to sniff out gas leaks. But he'd also, I think. I think this is the, this is right. I will probably have misremembered a detail, but if you look the book up, it's probably more interesting this way. <laughs> but basically, he had yeah, he had he had walked the length of the Manhattan sewers, and he had he had um, no, it wasn't Smell Like Kelly. That was a different character. This was Teddy Teddy something. But he basically this there was like there was a guy who had a map of the whole entire sewer system, and he he sort of walked it and plumbed it himself, and. Um, so he he heard members of his team reporting seeing alligators, and he was like, "That's nonsense. I've been down there. I've never seen alligators." And he went down to see them, and and sure enough, he he apparently saw an alligator, and <laughs> and is said to have organized a hunt with with rifles and uh, and you know poison traps. And it it sounds all a bit suspicious, but it's a fascinating story. And I think that Pinchon heard about that and and put it into his his, his work. Yeah. yeah so. So it was from that that I sort of got into Pynchon because, yes, of course, he's also a Cornelian. And um, um, I think it was I was more of a – in terms of the actual work, I was more of a, a, a Richard Ferenia fan who was also part of Pynchon Circle. Yeah. And he's only got the one novel, been down so long it looks like up to me. And Did you ever find the second book? Oh, he has a second one. There's a second collection called Long Time Coming and Long Time Gone. And oh, that, I've got a copy of it. I found it in a great used bookstore in Vermont. I did was, not know that. I yeah. did, I do I do know I do have the folk album he did with uh with with uh, Mimi Baez, yeah. but um I almost spent $900 on a poster for a the book signing he would have gone to had he not died in the motorcycle wreck uh 2 days earlier. And I saw it at the Antiquarian Book Fair in the city last oh, wow. year and I hemmed and hawed. I'm like, it's a lot of money. On the other hand, it's this. And in the time it took me to walk down the aisle and then think, no, I should really go do that. Somebody bought it. Of course. I was so thankful. I was like, oh, good. I didn't have to make the decision. I made the decision, but didn't have to, to spend the money. That's, I think, I, think I was at a, a book fair that had a, a the letter Thomas Pynchon wrote to Ferenia right after he read the manuscript had been down so long. And that was $10,000. So completely out of my price range. Yeah. But man, I was just like, oh, this this would be, <laughs> yeah, just this would be a thing around. to have. <laughs> Um, but more of a Ferenia guy than a, than a pinching guy. Yeah. And, um, and of course, yeah, it's, it's interesting to think what would have become of him if he had he'd not died in a motorcycle accident right after that book came out. But, um, I don't know. It's probably, yeah. It, it, when you were at Cornell, was there that sense of, um, the literary history of the, the, the students and faculty there? Was that, did that play into your education? Or I, I think as much of, of that was, a lot of that was just my own romanticizing of the, the campus. I mean, as, as soon as I got there, it's one of the most beautiful, physically beautiful campuses in the country. I mean, you know, Ithaca is, it's, it's the, the college is on a hill as, and cut by these, you know, cut, cut through by a gorge and, um, it's just a it's just a beautiful place to hang out. So and yes, and it does have this history because a lot of famous people have gone there. So I, I think it was it was less a sense I got from the college itself and more just my own. I fell in love with it right away and right away as soon as I got there, sort of thinking, well, yeah, I should I should write my first published novel. I should set it here because this, the campus itself can be a character and and then it will always be in print in at least one place. <laughs> So, um, so part of that was, yeah, I think a conscious decision just to become part of that history myself with the book. So, um, but there's plenty there if you want to indulge in that. I mean, the, the, I'm sure it's changed quite a bit since I've been there now, but, but since I've been there last, but, um, yeah. It's but for a, you, that was part of the, yeah, the that was part of the magic of it. The, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the lineage. Yeah. Did you feel you, um, you had to overcome, uh, literary, influences in that i guess that sort of harold bloomian way that there were writers you were too influenced by that you sort of felt you had to to get away from not not in a specific not like oh i've got to stop writing like so and so i think i was fortunate that i was i was one of those people who i i like my own writing voice once i found it i think my you know everyone's first novel is probably influenced much more by other things you've read than, than later work. So full in the hill, I, I can still like point to why, you know, where different things came from very disparate sources. But, um, that book, I was still sort of in part 
writing writing partly in imitation of other people whose work I admired. And I, I think I started to break away with that with sewer gas and electric. And then by the time I got to set this house in order, I sort of that was where I really kind of found my fully mature adult writer voice. But yeah, it wasn't so much a matter of feeling like I had to get away from anybody. It's just I had to grow up a little bit more hmm. and you know make some decisions about what kind of stuff I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. Um and, and part of that's just, you know, there are there are writing ticks that or things that seem really clever when you're young and you get a little older and you're like, all right, I can dial that wackiness back a lot. Like I think my my first two novels are definitely marked by any crazy idea I come up with, let me run with and make it see what yeah. I can do with it. And now I'm more selective and more conservative and i think for some readers that's probably a loss where if you if you there are people who love fool in the hill to death they feel like i i i got too too stayed in my old age or something they want that that youthful wackiness again um so things like that but i yeah i don't i don't have a conscious sense of, of any particular author who i didn't you know i oh can't can't be yeah, like no that anymore anxiety of influence no, sort of thing not really yeah, who were you reading when you were growing up uh, and I know this is, you know, a pretty wide ranging. No, yeah, uh, I, 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 um, I mean, I was a member of the Church of Stephen King. I was like a lot of people of of my generation. He was a big, big influence. Um, and you can certainly learn a lot, particularly from his early work. He's somebody else who I think Stephen's problem, I think, is that he he got too big to be edited. Mm -hmm. So I, I, as painful as it may have been for him, I think early on in his career when he wasn't getting enough respect from his publishing house, I think that the fact that, that folks could say no to him or, or make him pare stuff down actually worked better. And so his early novels I still think are wonderful and you can learn a lot about writing from them. Um, the later work, it's just like, I don't know, it, it, it doesn't work for me as well. Um, I don't remember anymore when I first discovered John Crowley, but he's still, you know, in in the high firmament for me. He's the he's just of of the writers. He's got to be my favorite now. Um, and John is much more of a writer's writer. I think I think a lot of other people are influenced by him. He he most readers though, and sadly, he just never got the readership he deserved. I'm still hopeful. He's not dead yet. He's yeah. still working. So but new book coming out this fall. We're getting back together this summer to record. Oh, so, excellent. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, he, he, and the work everyone knows about his is, is little big, which was, I think part of what impressed me about that was that it, it was the, the first book I read post post Tolkien that did not follow. It was like a, yeah. a big fantasy novel with fairies that were not like the elves in Tolkien. So mm -hmm. it was, it was a completely different feel to it and it's wonderful. Um, but the, the thing I really fell into was his, his Egypt cycle, which is... Um, did you do the fourth book? Yeah, I did, actually. I, I, I think it's because I read it on a Kindle, where <laughs> I read the other three in print, and I just couldn't get it. I have to go back and, and try it again, because it just didn't work for me. I, just I still have follow. not sat down and read all four yeah. in, in a row, which I would like to see what that's like. But um, for people who have no idea what we're talking about, though, this was a series of, of novels... And it's very hard to describe what they're about, but basically the, the core concept is that the the history of the world is changeable and that every so often um, the world passes through these turning points where all sorts of different possible futures and pasts roll out and then the world changes and then after the changing point has passed, you forget that the world could ever have been different than it has been. And you can see this as sort of a metaphor for different ways of, of thinking about the world where, you know, once upon a time people explain things with magic and religion and today we explain them with science. And the transition from one to the other in some ways is like traveling from one kind of world to another. But in the book there holds out this tantalizing possibility that the change is real. It's not just a metaphor. Um, but they're, they're an interesting set of books because they, first of all, they're very minimalistic in terms of plot. The the opening novel, it's basically a guy moves from the country to the city and a woman gets a divorce, and that's all yeah. that happens. The rest of it is just thinking about this idea. And it's it's like this massive, wonderful 
really hard to market set of yeah. books and it's a quartet and he spent john i think was working on it for something like 20 years from start to finish well, it was, and it was a was, trilogy and a, a long-awaited fourth yeah uh, and and there was some doubt as to whether it would ever be finished although typically for john crowley there are points in the the work itself where he talks about titanic works that set up this huge structure that may never be finished <laughs> so it's like the book is talking about itself as it goes along and uh Thank goodness the, he lived yeah. long enough that he actually got to to finish it. But I think the 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 second book with the first seventy or so pages with that character's childhood in Kentucky is just one of the favorite one of my favorite pieces of writing ever. And Again, it's, just, it's a weird structural choice. You're expecting yeah. yes, let's get back to the present, and instead he starts off with a completely nope. different <laughs> thing, which is is again fits into you. He sort of warned you that this was going to happen. So. So it's very much a writer's work and that, yeah, I think for a lot of readers, they'd be just like, what the hell is this? What am I, what am I doing here? And why is this guy spending so much of his writing life? But thank goodness he did, because to me, it was just a, I still go back and reread parts of it. It's just wonderful. I think the difficulty with the fourth book too, is because you've waited so long for it. It's like your, your expectations have been built. You, you, it can never live up to what you were thinking it was going to be. And then it's over. Yeah. And that, that tends to be the case with most artwork that I, I adore, uh, or most artists who's, who's, you know, for whom I, there's a strong work. I've never forgiven them, uh, the Cohen brothers for not making Miller's Crossing again and again and again. <laughs> uh, I know it's a weird choice of, of favorite Cohen's films, but, you know, everything I see, there's always the, it, it took years and years for me to, let me just watch a new Cohen's flick wow. without the weight of this one particular movie that, that really worked for me. Danny Boyle movies were the same way. Shallow Grave did something for me and the later stuff I was always. Yeah. He's, he's somebody who, yeah, Danny Boyle fascinates me. I love his films. They never quite work. There's always a choice he makes that I don't yeah. quite. Yeah. And, and, but, but they're fun. Yeah. Again, go back to Shallow Grave. You know, it, it works. And there's still a, uh, a thing that happens at one point that doesn't quite make sense plot-wise. But, uh, but watching Train Spotting after that, I was completely disappointed because this isn't Shallow Grave. And then years For later, me, it was like, yeah, I Train think Spotting's it was, fine. It's either know. 28 Days Later or, or Sunshine were the two I sort of pinball back and forth between. Yeah. On Sunshine in particular, is just, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a really interesting film to watch that doesn't quite yeah. work. <laughs> Yeah. But I'm I'm glad they got it made. But he was ambitious enough to, yeah. to do it. Yeah. And 28 days later, just shooting fast zombies on video instead of film mm -hmm. was, was one of the few movies I actually went out to the theater to go see because I live an incredibly boring life. Uh, <laughs> that's just the way I am. Um, now, when it comes to guys like Crowley, though, guys who um, are big influences of yours, who are living authors, um, interact with them much? Do you? John and I are friends. We got to know yeah. each other. I, I, I think. I think. One of the benefits probably of, of moving to Seattle is that there is a big clarion's here and the you know the science fiction museum is here. So there's there's a community and if you get tied into it, you can get introductions like everybody in the sci-fi world comes through Seattle at some point. Sure. And if I really want to meet them, I usually can at this point. So I yeah, wasn't um, sure I if it that, was that or convention culture or uh, yeah. you know, if it's more likely. Well, I've never been a I've never been a big con goer, but um, because again, that's a that's I think. The con life is much more for people who are strictly going to be in, in, in genre and mm -hmm. writing in genre. And I, I was always kind of a little too weird for them I, in that I, I wasn't, I was too fickle. I was not devoted to just doing one thing. It's like, yeah, I'll write, I'll write a sci-fi kind of sci-fi book now, but then I'm going to go do this thing. And you're not even going to review it because it's not your kind of thing. And then I'm, yeah. So, but, um, no, but it's, it's, uh, I've, I've gotten to meet a couple of interesting people that way. And, and so, yeah, at some point I got introduced to John and, and managed not to be a complete fawning idiot when I met him. So, <laughs> so now we, yeah, we, we keep track of each other. And, yes. Yeah. I have Paul DeFilippo as my entree into, to meeting a lot of these guys. And, and Paul helps sort of just I've met Paul. I get everybody yeah. out of the same page and, and, you know, oh, come out to dinner. It's me and Crowley and this one and that one and the other. And we just, yeah, shoot the breeze. Um, which uh, I always have the tourist aspect of it. I'm, oh no, no, I'm not a writer and, or a critic. You know, I'm, I'm just some schlub from New Jersey with a couple of microphones. <laughs> so, um, works for me. Um, but do you, do you, um, yeah, this will sound bizarre. Do you see younger authors who treat you the way you, you look up at other authors? Have you been an influence or, you know, the, wow, well, I want to be like Matt Ruff, uh, um, as I, I'm sure they exist. I, I don't think I've bumped into anybody, anybody, at least not lately, that I remember who's, who's reacted that way. I mean, part of the problem is because I'm, because I'm so all over the place, I don't think I've got as, as 
fixed uh, uh, a style, style for somebody yeah. to fix on. It's like mm-hmm. with Stephen King, you could see you'd want to be the next Stephen King. And even with Crowley, I think you, you know, John is just odd enough. I think, I think with him, it's just more, he's kind of all over there too, but he's, he's got that just something amazing in his style and his, his thinking that you kind of want to emulate. Um, but with me, I don't know. I, 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 I'll have to look out for that, but not so far, <laughs> yeah. not yet. Um, and no stalkers or anything along the same lines. That's good. No, not that I've noticed. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's for the best. So, so you mentioned Seattle being that, that sort of nexus point and, and people coming through. What brought you to, uh, to Seattle and what keeps you here? Basically, my, my, when my wife and I got married, she was working for Bowman Rare Books in Philadelphia, and I was a published novelist, so... Um, I was living up in Maine, and I came down to Philadelphia, and we got married. And, and part of the deal was that we would try to get out of the city relatively soon because I just didn't want to live in Philadelphia. Um, I think partly because if you grow up in New York City like I did, all other East Coast big cities are ruined for you. It's just yeah. it's not New York. And having <laughs> lived in Maine and a couple of other places where I could just take long walks, uh, Philadelphia is not really a walking city either. So... We wanted to move, you know, the idea was that Lisa would, would sort of work long distance for the Bowmans, which she was able to do for a while before she, she broke off into her own career as a, as a researcher and, and editor. But, um, but basically because our jobs were portable, we could move anywhere we wanted to. So it was just a question of where do we want to live. And what we wanted was a place that had four seasons but did not have the brutal winters of the East Coast. And so the Pacific Northwest was basically met our criteria. So we came out and we went to Portland and uh, in Oregon and we went to Seattle and we picked Seattle. And uh, I had lived here briefly with my college girlfriend back in the late 80s. So I knew I liked it and Lisa ended up really liking it too. And so that's why, that's how we got here. And it's, it's coming up on, gosh, uh, I think we moved out in August of 2000. So um, it's coming up on our, our 17th anniversary in Seattle. Um, now, you describe yourself as a literary shut-in, but how much have you seen the city change in that 17-year span? Or what has changed for you? Oh, it's, I mean, there's a lot of new construction. Places that, that once felt remote are are not so much anymore, um, which is fine for us. I mean, we, you know, we like being able to afford <laughs> to live close to the city, and, and, and that means they've got they've to increase density because this place is so popular now with the influx of new Amazon and Microsoft employees. Um, but it's getting more and more expensive. I mean, the, the rents here are getting comparable to San Francisco's and New York's. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting challenge to see. I mean, again, the HBO series will help. I was going to say, thank God for HBO. <laughs> yeah, no, because we were, we were thinking that um, we had had to move uh, earlier. That actually, just, just last February is when we moved into this house. And um, it had been our first move in nine years. It was kind of sticker shock to see how much starting mm-hmm. rent thresholds had become. Um, so, yeah, that's the main thing is that the city has gotten a lot more people live here now. I think the population has gone up at least 100,000 since we got here. And um, places that you could walk around, neighbors that felt deserted once upon a time now have all kinds of new construction and, and you know, getting taller. But there are still, of course, limits on how tall you can build, which I think is, in the long run, maybe a mistake because it, it just means that rents are going to keep going up because there's still not going to be enough housing even if they turn everything into townhouses. Yeah. So it's this weird transition. I mean, when you when you leave today, if as you're driving down the block, you'll see there's there's a bunch of new uh, two and three story townhouse buildings next to these one story either ranch or bungalow style places that have probably been here since the 50s or the 40s, and um, that's the biggest difference is that that is that has happened. Mm-hmm. Do you find? Um Let's see. I guess a shorter historical timeline here than in the the Northeast. Yeah, uh, definitely. And is that you, you, know, you, you definitely you're definitely struck by that that in, in good ways and bad. Um, it's when we moved here, we, it definitely felt like a weird combination of small town and big city. And now the the big city aspect is coming up a little more, but you still don't have the layers of revolutionary Corru- history or oh, well, well I'm, I'm yeah. thinking i'm thinking more in terms of 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 bureaucratic corruption you have back east <laughs> where you you know 
Yeah, um, New York City. Uh, just yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, you're you're not you know you're not dealing with with four you know centuries of entrenched local interests. Here, it's just one century of entrenched local <laughs> interests. So it's still kind of cute when they try to be corrupt and. and yeah. <laughs> they don't understand like Robert Moses and. and right. Yeah. Exactly. So. Um, <laughs> But yes, the fact that yeah, it only goes back to the the late eighteen hundreds is kind of a, a weird thing, and and you can you can sort of still see the bones of the original city at least in some places showing through, um, as much as it has changed in that time span. But it it just feels like a lot younger city than the the yeah the gigantic metropolises back east. So, hmm. so besides Crowley, who else were you? Grooving on when you were you were younger, and who you know kind of set you along this path. Uh, King was the the big one. You King mentioned, King yeah. was a big one. Um, I was you know I'm, I'm I am still a very big Shirley Jackson fan, and I discovered her early on. I don't know how huge an influence she was, but she's she's one of those people I reread obsessively. Mm-hmm. Um, William Gibson is somebody too. I I, I was going to ask because I I kind of figured you were in that age range for. I was I, yeah I was just at the right age when Neuromancer came out and and you know it, it came with all the right recommendations and of course you 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 get that for every new science fiction writer but in his case it was like oh wow yeah this is great stuff and it kept being great so. Um, and then you have a whole coterie of guys around him in that whole movement. Um, yeah, although most of the others didn't really didn't really do it for me. Yeah. I mean, Bill's got very specific and a lot of it is just the language. There's there's just stuff I like. I like the way he writes that it's not just what he's writing about but the way he does it that really speaks to me. Um yeah, Clute tried connecting us for uh, for this trip. In which case, I would have recorded with him and not you. Yeah. But I think you Fair would have been, Yeah, you would have been fine with uh yeah. you know, I'm second best. That, that's okay. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was I was a guy who discovered him when I was twelve or thirteen. I think you're just a couple of years older than me, so. Yeah, I think I must have been. Gosh, that would have been. When did Neuromancer come out? Eighty four. I must say eighty four. So I would have been thirteen. And I'd have been nineteen. Yeah. So yeah, I remember I was in. Yeah, I was already in college then, and it was just like, huh, this is. It's yeah. pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the delayed lightning bolt effect with oh my god, yeah, that was totally yeah. <laughs> Well, he he really just picked the perfect time to publish that novel. I mean, it's it's you know today, of course, the, it's become it's become a very standard joke to go back and point at all the things he he sort of got wrong, but it doesn't matter. It's like that's yeah. exactly why he's still read is that it works even even if you see the the predictions that didn't pan out or that didn't fit. Sort of another one I I'd, I'd, I'd mention, although he's not actually more of a more of an I don't I don't even, I don't want to call it a negative influence, but when I was still very young, I was given a boxed set of Robert Heinlein, but it wasn't the juveniles. It was late Heinlein. It was Time Enough for Love. It was um, Stranger in a Strange Land, um, the future history. And this is, of course, totally inappropriate. Late Heinlein is totally inappropriate for 11 and 12-year-olds, <laughs> but apparently whoever gave it to me didn't know that. And so... And yeah, I think Heinlein I read- was the first, yeah, he was the first author I read where I had the sense of, okay, I like what he's trying to do here, but I, I think he's making all the wrong choices in doing it. He would, you know, the, the plot descriptions for the Heinlein novels would sound great, but the actual writing would be just like, why are you doing that? And that the big example for me was always the, the Time Enough for Love, where you've got this story about a guy who lives 2,000 years and, you know, all the things he's done. And that sounds really interesting until you find out the secret to his longevity is that he's just one of the most boring people in the universe. He, <laughs> so there's hope for me yet is what you're saying. He, Sorry, go Yeah, on. <laughs> no, he, he brags about the fact that, yes, you know, I always run from a fight when I can and I you know, try to avoid trouble. It's true. That, that would make you live longer. But, <laughs> but it's, it's just, it's, it's just he, he'll talk on forever about, less, like, yes, when you're packing for a trip, you need to do this and this and this and this and, like, all of the... All the stuff you would kind of expect for somebody, yes, who was cautious enough to survive for 2,000 years, but it's, it's just incredibly tedious. And when he's not talking about, like, yes, here's my 500-page here's my list of things to bring when you're deciding to go, you know, be a, be a pioneer on a new planet, he'll, he'll be expounding on his weird sexual adventures. But 
on the one hand, he's, he's such a rebel and so radical and into polyamory and stuff, but you never actually see him do anything. He always cuts away. And, and I guess that was partly just at the time you couldn't write explicitly about sex in science fiction, but I'm like, it's this weird, it's this weird combination of shy and supposedly radical and, and groundbreaking. And, um, it's very telling that the the most interesting part of that novel is where you get to the end and he basically like I think the the one of the gimmicks in Time Enough for Love is that he's basically they've they've brought him back from near death and and he said, Well you've you know, if you if you find something for me to do that I haven't done before, then you know, I'll stick around and help you with your problem. And so what they figure out is that he's never time traveled before. And they figure out that this, this rocket engine they've got lets him do that. So he decides to go back in time and meet his first family and falls in lust with his own mother and then conspires to figure out how he can sleep with her. And basically he gets into this weird pissing match with his grandfather where he knows that World War I is going to be a terrible mistake, and so he decides not to sign up, and his grandfather thinks he's a coward for not joining the military. So the only way he can keep coming around the house to try and sleep with his mother is by joining the military in World War I. And it's like, okay, so this whole novel, you've been telling me how careful you are and how you always run when you can, and now for, for granted for the unique opportunity to commit <laughs> incest with your own mother, you're going to throw caution out the window and join the military. And, and I'm laughing because it's, it's like, it's actually the most interesting part of the novel. It's still, he still manages to do it wrong, but I would love to try and tell that story in a way that would work. And, and that was not the only time that happened where I read a Robert Heinlein novel and I thought, yeah, I, I, I hate all of these choices, but the, the plot structure would be kind of interesting to play with. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so at least, yeah, negative, uh, that, that does work as a not exactly negative influence, but you know, so yeah, it's it's and again I'm like I'm yes I'm twelve reading this I have no idea what what I must have made of that but yeah but that was that was the reaction that stayed with me is like yeah. <laughs> interesting concept terrible execution uh, favorite chapter of Lovecraft Country ooh um, probably a toss up between. Um, between uh, Jekyll and Hyde Park and Hippolyta Disturbs the Universe, although I'd have to go with Hippolyta if I were going to only get one choice. That was mine. But, you know. Oh, yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> so. I think for being the most SF-specific uh, uh, angle. but I Yeah, for me, yeah. it was just, it was it was funny. I, I it's, it's an unusual chapter. It's the first chapter in the novel where, that's centered on somebody we haven't actually met earlier in the story. Mm-hmm. And part of, part of the thing when I was writing this novel is I, I had a hard word limit like that, that it had to, it, you know, it couldn't be longer than 125,000 words. And this is the first novel where that was the case. And it turned out that was more than enough to do what I needed to do. But I was worried by the time I got to the Hippolyta chapter that I was going to run out of space before I was done. And I also knew that although her story is is essential, as essential as any other part of it, if you were being ruthless and had to hack away, that was the one you would get rid of. So there was a part of me that I kind of knew it had to be so good that that nobody would, you know, dare suggest pulling it out. And I think that's part of the reason it works as well as it does is that I, I really tried extra double hard to make it, it work and, and stand up and, and be worthy. And, um, and also do it in a, a tight enough format that it wasn't going to bloat longer than the other chapters. And so that, that I managed to make that work, but, and I just, I just love her story and it's, I wish I could remember how I came up with the, the trick of her wanting to be, you know, basically she's, she's this, this black woman who basically when she was a little girl fell in love with astronomy and wanted to grow up to be Clyde Tumbaugh, the guy who, who discovered Pluto. And I don't know how that particular backstory, I don't remember anymore how that particular connection between her and Tombow first came about, but I'm really glad I came up with it because it, it makes for a fun, a fun little backstory of the parts where she's thinking about her childhood and falling in love with astronomy and wanting to, you know, help name Pluto because yeah. there was that, that moment when kids were writing into the, the observatory, the Lowell observatory saying, Oh, I know the, the perfect name for that new planet. So nowadays we just go with, 
planet McPlanet face yeah. because we live in a dumb, dumb age. Do you keep a, a notebook with you when you're out of the house? No, I should, but um, I'm, I'm... Or is writing really a... No, you know, I, 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 anytime I'm alone or in a room and not talking to someone for more than three or four minutes, I trip into this sort of introspective thing where I start talking to myself. So I'm always thinking about stories, but... Um, I think partly to justify my own laziness, I just tell myself, well, if I have a good idea that I have to write down to remember, it's not really that good. If it's a good <laughs> idea, then I'll, I will know it. It will stay with me. And that's sort of true, but not really. Like, yeah, it'll stay with me for, you know, three or six months. But if I need to think about it a year or two later, I, I often regret that I didn't take notes. Or sometimes I'll go back and read something I wrote or started writing a, a while back and I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm glad I started writing this then. Cause I would have totally forgot this bit of business that actually yeah. works really well here. So. Yeah. I, I want just as somebody who's a failed writer, I like to think that there's at least one thing I should be doing that would, you know, somehow facilitate this as opposed to just That's one lazy. of those things where everybody's different though. So yeah, it, it if, if I were ever going to do a list of, of writerly advice, I'd have to break it down by, you know, things that are true for everybody, which would probably be like one or two things. And then, you know, stuff that's purely optional. If it works for you, great. If not, don't worry about it. Um, and what is your, besides, um, near schizophrenic level of, of, you know, muttering to yourself when you're alone, um, what other writerly, uh, what do you do in particular? What's your work routine like, I guess? If I'm actually getting work done, it usually tends to happen first thing in the morning. Like I've, I've, I'm turning more and more into my dad as I get old. When I was a kid, I never understood why anyone would want to get up before eight o'clock, but um, unless they had to go to school, and then you don't really want to get up anyway. But now I, I, I tend to if I, if I can get myself out of bed before dawn, around you know three or four, and and put in a good couple of hours work, then I make progress. And if I start work later in the day, I can sometimes still make progress, but I'm more likely to get distracted by other things. And um, that's the main thing is just being disciplined about it. And this is where selling books in advance and having a deadline looming out in the distance, scaring the heck out of you, you know, not wanting to disappoint your, your publisher who's been so very nice to let you do this unusual yeah. <laughs> subject that, um, that can be very helpful at sort of keeping me focused and, and getting stuff done. Um, left to my own devices. I just, the problem is I tend to be a perfectionist. So I will write things over and over. I'll go back and revise. So my my first submission drafts are actually like most people's polished fourth or fifth drafts by the time I'm done with them. Um, Do you find it difficult to work up to continue writing something when you have to go back and, and edit and polish? Or are you kind of able to say, you know, that, okay, I've done enough for the moment. Let me work on you know, what's to come. It's, it's all part of the same deal, like where I'll... I'll the reworking is easier because the heavy lifting has mostly been done. So if I'm if I'm getting tired, it's it's often easier to go back and do that. Um, See, I find myself compulsively going back and revising to the point at which I can't get anything new done, which is why I haven't finished anything in thirty years. Well, but yeah, I, no, I've life. I've I've done that too, but. Um, yeah, I I think that's that's part of the reason I do it is like I need I need at least a day to recharge after I've made significant forward progress. So okay. then I'll just go back and look at the older stuff and and revise and revise and revise and it's got its benefits because by the time I I get done with the novel, I'll have the the whole thing pretty much memorized. And that's very useful for um sort of major shifts and changes and revisions and it it's very good for copy editing your own stuff. It's a little difficult in that you get so used to the cadence of the way certain things are written that even if they don't work, it's very hard to let that go. Mm -hmm. um, so I occasionally do the Hamlet thing where I will go back and forth between two totally trivial, yeah. different changes of on something. Um, but yeah, that's that's the main thing is just just keep working on it. I used to it used to be I I could not jump ahead or back and forth where I had to I had to just do continually. Um, sort of linearly tell yeah the, the story and as i've as i've gotten older i think partly because i've done things like lovecraft country where it is is more episodic i jump back and forth in that book more than i, I have i think in in any other case and that's sort of stayed with me now and, and stuff i'm i'm sort of contemplating at the moment where i i don't feel wedded to being exactly linear um so that's a change but um 
the trick though just is to yeah to focus on one thing long enough to get enough done <laughs> yeah i don't know what you're talking yeah, about yeah yeah <laughs> i'll leave you with a uh probably terrible last question but yeah i'll throw it anyway you mentioned um getting more like your dad as you get older yeah. just in terms of, of waking up early um you come from a family of of pastors ministers yes. uh, people who are religious and lutheranism and your mom was mormon no, no my, grandma, my mother my mother was with my grandmother grandma converted to mormon. mormonism yeah. yeah religiosity in your life uh no i mean i the, the the this is this is sort of the the downside or well, no, it's not a downside it's it's a side effect of this this desire to understand people who are different from me is that you know conservative lutheranism like a lot of conservative christian faiths it's very exclusionary you're either saved or you're not and i i just couldn't really accept that divide i couldn't i mean i could I could accept other people believing that, but it seemed like it seemed like more of a human invention than than something a divine creator would believe in. Yeah. And so I I don't think I could I could practice a religion that has an in groups and out groups that seems to be based entirely on having the good fortune to be born into the right faith. I mean, because that's why I, I was confirmed Lutheran. It wasn't that I you know thought through all the religions and picked the one that was better. It was like no, that was what my family was, and so that was what I was expected to be. And that's a really weird way to decide whether you're going to, you know, eternal salvation, eternal yeah. salvation <laughs> or eternal damnation. And, um, so it just became more and more apparent as I, I got to be a teenager that, that, that was probably just a, a system that human beings had come up with. And, and, uh, I didn't, I didn't buy it. And there are more liberal interpretations, interpretations of Christianity you could go towards. But at that point it becomes clear. You're just sort of, you're kind of, making up a religion rather than I, I want my religion to actually describe the way the world, the universe works. And if it doesn't do that, if I, if it's just a, a, a way of inspiring myself and feeling good and, and so forth, I can do that on my own. I don't need to go to church on Sunday to get that. So, so yeah, no, I ended up falling away from the church and, um, you know, uh, my parents did not live long enough for me to really know how they would have adjusted to that. Uh, my mom died right before I graduated college. And um, we were sort of at the point where she knew I was sort of becoming an, agni an atheist slash agnostic, but we hadn't had the, the real showdown over it yet. So I don't know. I don't know what her long term reaction to that would have been. And dad was always more mellow. Dad, it's, it's funny, although he's a preacher, I think. People tend to expect he would have been very strict, but it was my mother who came from the missionary side of the family who was much more into, no, 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 this is what you're supposed to believe. Yeah. So dad was like, you know, if you don't want to believe, you don't have to. It's, it's your choice. And um, so, but he, he passed away about four years after mom. So very early on, I was on my own. And uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't felt the need to uh, go back to church now that I'm getting older and I'm, I'm eventually going to die soon, it's like I'm kind of hoping there's something more, but it doesn't change my <laughs> my basic attitude. And I think the other part of it, too, this is part of both being a novelist and being a, a minister's son and seeing how other people reacted to my father growing up where they would they would sort of – I knew the real man and they would see the office. Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm very aware of – the ability to the people have to suspend disbelief and and conjure a belief in something that isn't real and it's, it's sort of like being a stage magician where i get how it works but because i get how it works i'm i have a much harder time believing it myself yeah. and so that that too i think works against being religious at least for me so that's the that's the long and the short of that <laughs> and i figured I'd, I'd leave off with a nice easy no, question at absolutely the end. <laughs> Matt Ruff, thanks so much for coming on the Virtual Memories Show. Thank you very much for having me. And that was Matt Ruff. Like I said at the beginning, Lovecraft Country is a wonderful novel. Uh, it also, um, as I mentioned at the beginning in my weird, shameful way, has the uh, black science fiction and fantasy writer seal of approval. Um, I really dug the other books of, of Matt's that I've read, too. Bad Monkeys, uh, this weird Philip K. Dickian um, 
novel. We'll just leave it at that. And Sewer, Gas, and Electric, the Public Works trilogy that's a bit more Pynchon-esque um, and just as strange. Um, Lovecraft Country is out in paperback, so pick that up at your favorite bookstore. And visit buymattruff.com to learn more about Matt and his work. And that's B Y M A T T R U F F dot com. In addition to information about his books and some blogs, um, there's also some really neat essays and other pieces on the site. So go check it out by mattruff.com and pick up Lovecraft Country. You will not be disappointed. Now, once we wrapped up the main session, I asked Matt, so who are you reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that, and it is a weird one, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet. I've just posted a new one with last quarter's guests, and it is dynamite. You can get access by supporting the show at patreon.com slash vmspod or at paypal.me slash vmspod. There are a bunch of other goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, the series of ebooks that I will get around to launching once all of this riding up and down the East Coast on the Acela thing lessens up a little bit. And there'll be more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, this episode was part of a Seattle mini vacation that I will be honest was expensive as all get out. But that said, it was part of a vacation and a pal's wedding. So it's not like I was traveling just to do the podcast. Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, and equipment, in fact, this one uh, required two Uber rides from our hotel over to, to Matt's place in Ballard and back. Um, anyway, you can visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. The special thanks go out to Kevin Katila, John Wendler, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Stefan Nadler, Wallace Wilde Manozzi, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Garrett Zecker, Craig P. Stephan, Jack Les Camella, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash VM. Now, our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David has a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David. And you can find out more and support that at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Patty Farmer, author of the new book Playboy Laughs, the comedy, comedians, and cartoons of Playboy. Until next time... You can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store or at soundcloud.com slash vmspod. You can also find all our episodes and get in our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or the more comprehensive chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtual memories show and at virtual memories podcast dot tumblr dot com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the virtual memories show and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. Till next time, you've been listening to the virtual memories show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. 